All right, and we are live. So welcome everyone who is joining. Uh, I have with me today Brian Fannin. Uh, Brian is a research actuary for the CAS. He also has a lot of experience in the corporate sector um, as a leader and as an actuary and as an expert in R. So I'm excited to dive into all that. So thank you for joining, Brian. My pleasure to be here. And just so you're all aware, uh, the screen may look a little different than the traditional YouTubes. Um, this is a little bit of a new technology, so you'll see me up in the corner and Brian is on the main screen. Um, so we're hoping that this works out well. Um, so just to start off, Brian, why don't you go ahead and, and, and kind of give a background, introduce yourself. Okay. So uh, I've been an actuary for 20 odd years, uh, long enough that I've kind of stopped counting. For about the past year and a half, I have been the research actuary for the Casualty Actuarial Society. Um, one of four actuaries on staff for the CAS. Uh, we also have a staff actuary and a couple of actuaries in China. Uh, my role is to support all of the research committees for the CAS, to uh, talk through research ideas with them, to support them, uh, and also, and probably most significantly, to have a good deal of influence over how we disperse the CAS reinsurance, or excuse me, reinsurance research budget. Uh, we do a lot okay. of contracted research with academic institutions or consultancies, or even just uh, kind of ad hoc uh, researchers uh, out in the wild to generate research content that's going to be useful for the membership. Interesting. So are you the, like, you're the main research guy then? Are, are there other research actuaries at the CAS or? On staff, no. Uh, now, I do get support from the staff actuary sure. and other staff members, uh, both for processing of ideas, uh, thinking through that, but also logistical support. Uh, the way that the CIS is structured, we have a pretty lean staff. Uh, most of the work is done by volunteers. And so the volunteer oh, okay. of the CIS uh, is one where there's an executive council, there's a board of directors. Gotcha. I have a lot of contact with the VP of research, who is at the moment um, Avi Adler. Okay. And they have, I think, a two-year or three-year term. So uh, Avi and I are going to be working together for at least another, another year or so. Wow. Interesting. So do you, at the CAS, like a lot of the research that you do, is it with data from various insurance companies that that you guys uh, receive and then you dig through and you're doing your research items mm -hmm. that way or is it other types of data you're working with? So the answer to your question, no. And this is something that we're trying to address. Okay. Uh, what I can say is there will be circumstances where a researcher has access to data from, uh, uh, from whatever means that must remain confidential. Yeah, um, sure, sure. We will support that as so long as the research findings are going to be tangible and relevant and uh, easily digestible. Uh, we are very interested in getting some sources of information from insurers, so there's be actual real insurance data, Yes. Uh, that we can make available for research of various project types. Now, obviously, that information needs to have personally identifiable information redacted. Mm -hmm. uh, there are various algorithmic approaches we can take to anonymize that data further. Uh, so there are those protocols that we would take, obviously, to maintain the integrity of the information. Uh, we're continuing to have conversations with people. We do have one source of, so say, real insurance data available uh, to researchers. It would be... So rate-making rate data for non-life insurance, for okay. PNC type insurance. Now, researchers do have to sign an NDA. Yeah, uh, We're very, very careful about handling sensitive information. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. But that is uh, the largest source of uh, insurance company data that we have. Okay. Interesting. So how would you say your role as a research actuary is different from your more traditional roles as an actuary, um, just to help people that may be interested in the future for doing something like that? Very different. Uh, <laughs> I bet. So one of the elements that is more or less gone, I shouldn't say gone, but it has been diminished substantially, the amount of contact that I have with non-actuaries is not nearly what it used to be. Uh, in, okay. in some of my other previous roles. 
this means that the amount of time that I'm spending uh, trying to communicate the actual results, uh, but more significantly, the amount of time that, that I spend trying to, uh, you know, I don't want to use the word persuade, but to to sort of get buy-in on yeah. the actual analysis, uh, that is a thing of the past. So in that respect, the role is very, very different. Uh, there are many, many other elements that are the same. Uh, it's still actuarial science. It is still ingestion of insurance data from whatever sources we have available mm -hmm. to try and quantify and manage risk. Uh, the joy is that I'm plugged into actuaries uh, all over the world from many, many different companies, not just the one that I happen to be working at, right. uh, to get their perspectives on how to address that issue. That's that's pretty amazing. So uh, when you first took this role, I mean, did you kind of know that the CAS had this type of role available or did someone approach you and that's kind of how you got into this? Well, I saw the position open up and at the time I had been doing some independent consulting, which was uh, very, very fun. Um, the thing about independent consulting is you get to set your own hour. Well, you don't really get to set your own hour. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you get to you get to set uh, uh, you get to set your alarm to get up early. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, it was it was uh, it was a kind of work that offered a great deal of freedom and a lot of interesting projects, but uh, having the predictability of uh, a full-time role yeah. was something that was of interest to me. Um, what I was very, very drawn to is all of those things that I just mentioned. Uh, well, also among others, we were chatting before uh, we went live. Mm -hmm. I got to work remotely, which meant that I could stay here, yep. uh, uh, and also would be solely a research role, uh, in research you know, to do with the research which is uh, one of the things that I've enjoyed most uh, about being an actuary. Yeah, uh, no, I believe it. I'm curious yeah. with like, you know, because you've, you've been in some more high profile type role, and this might still mm -hmm. be considered high profile, but like as a chief actuary mm -hmm. compared to like a CAS research actuary, yeah. um, in terms of the stress levels and the deadlines and things like that, mm -hmm. would you say it's comparable or would you say it's less stressful now compared to like your more traditional role? Kind of apples and oranges in, in a lot of ways. Okay, the it's not very. You can't really compare it. <laughs> well, you can compare. So here's what has not changed: is that I still have clients. I mean, okay. uh, even when I'm working in house, uh, whoever you're talking to, if it's it's the underwriter, if it's the claims people, like they're your clients. Yeah, yeah. You work company. Uh, so you still have clients that need that need serving. Uh, the difference is that uh, the way that that comes about feels different um, in that um, it, it, it is, well, the stressors are different. Um, yeah, I believe that, it. That as an actuary, one of the great stressors is not necessarily about finishing work on time. We can do that. Um, it is about uh, crossing that threshold where the client knows that the work is finished. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> Where, and, and, and what that means is uh, for it to be uh, digestible, mm -hmm. uh, for it to be credible, uh, for it to feel uh, like it has a high degree of utility. Mm -hmm. No, I believe that. So if if a person were interested in going this kind of a route, um, I, I don't know how many research the actuaries the SOA might have, the CAS mm -hmm. and some of the other societies. Um, is this uh, a route that like a lot of people could do, or is this a very limited thing where it's kind of like one person here, one person there? Um, I, the answer is, well, so I can say that it, it's going to be pretty niche. Um, globally, I think the number of property casualty research actuaries who do that full time outside of academia uh, I mean, it would be less than 50 people on earth. Now, yeah, this doesn't mean that I'm amazing that. or special. It just means that, uh, it's very niche. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And there are, there are other 
product types and their other actuarial roles that are quite niche. Mm -hmm. Like Uber hires actuaries and they have like maybe four of them. I actually saw that just recently and yeah. I was like, oh, interesting. They must have some insurance side to Uber that the actuaries work on. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So it is a very niche kind of risk management. Yeah. Uh, if you are interested in, well, a couple of things. If you're interested in doing research, uh, especially if you want to do research for the CAS, uh, that's always available. Yeah. Uh, most of the research is volunteer driven. So if you're a member, uh, then definitely there are research committees that would be happy to have your input. Yeah. Uh, either in terms of generating ideas for new research uh, or for actively doing it. Uh, so if, if that's something that people are interested in, you know, pick up a copy of Variance, pick up a copy of like the Aston Bulletin, start reading the articles and getting a sense for uh, what the conversation is in the literature. Awesome. So to kind of uh, totally switch gears here, uh, I, I definitely wanted to find out about the, the research side, but I also know you're an expert in R and programming, and I, I really wanted to, to, to get to that. So cool. um, so no smooth transition. I'm just going over to programming. Not a problem. Uh, do you... uh, I, I, don't need, I don't need a reason to talk about R. <laughs> okay, uh, that's good. That's yeah, good. <laughs> without any provocation whatsoever. <laughs> um, to start off, do you have a, like a background in programming, or is that something that kind of came along the way as you were working? I think like a lot of actuaries, I picked up programming by necessity, uh, discovered that it had a, a pretty high utility, mm -hmm. that I could do more interesting work faster. Um, it's interesting, the very first role that I ever had out of college um, was not actuarial. It was, it was, I think they would have, they would not have described it as a, as a programming role. They didn't, but it required a lot of programming. Okay. Um, because I happen to know, to know Fortran, gotcha. uh, which will suggest to you roughly <laughs> how long ago. I mean, Fortran is still around. But yeah, some people still use not, it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it's, and it's not going anywhere. Uh, so from there, it, it, it became an easy transition to technologies like VBA. Mm -hmm. And once you find that you enjoy programming, you, you kind of look for opportunities to, to do more of it. Uh, I became aware of R in about 2008 or nine or something like that. Okay. And at that time, uh, it was pretty niche and trying to get it installed on a corporate laptop was a headache okay. because the, the laptops are, are very, very tightly controlled and for, for good reason. They don't mm -hmm. want people to just uh, install anything on a rather sensitive corporate sure. asset. And R is, it's like an open source language, right? R is open source and uh, a pretty pretty safe product. I mean, it, it is possible for you know for malware to get in there, but I don't know that there have been any instances of uh, of that having having taken place. Sure. Um, so it was not until I think 2010 or 11 that I began using it in earnest, and quickly discovered that it was going to be my preferred calculating environment. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's amazing. So on that note, though, would you, if you were to recommend an actuary, if they don't know any programming mm -hmm. and they want to learn programming for their role, and let's say yeah. they had to choose between SAS, R, and Python. Okay. Uh, I know you're biased towards R, so I'm guessing that's what you're <laughs> going to say, but what would you recommend and why? So uh, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, tweak your question a little bit. Okay. It will depend on where the actuary is. I mean, if, if I'm an actuary who, let's say that I'm a student uh, about to graduate, mm -hmm. uh, maybe here I'll answer that question. Because what I was going to say is uh, whatever your company is using, you'd better be good at that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <it's> definitely. <laughs> uh, so if, you're, if your company is a SaaS shop, then definitely uh, learn SaaS. If I am a student about to graduate and I'm speaking to prospective employers, I'm going to suggest R, mm -hmm. uh, although there's nothing wrong with Python. My recommendation is learn one of them fluently mm -hmm. so that you can do uh, any number of worthwhile tasks, be it like automation of like file creation and editing, uh, those kinds of low-level um sort of boring automatable routines. Yes. Uh, getting data in and out of a database, getting uh, data in and out of an Excel file, that kind of thing. Python and R both do those well. Yes. Uh, 
I give R the edge on the uh, the universe of packages that are specifically tailored for predictive modeling for uh, all manner of statistical algorithms, artificial intelligence, and so on. So in terms of its statistical ability, you would you would give R the edge? That, yeah, I would. Yeah. Um, I mean, at this point, it is so familiar to me that uh, the cost of learning an additional set of functionality in R is very, very low. Yeah, the benefit you would get would not outweigh the cost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that makes sense. Um, and I, you, you and I were talking a little before we went live, and I have more experience in SaaS, and yeah. um, that's because of the way you answered that question. The companies that I've worked at use SaaS almost yep. exclusively. And it wasn't that I had anything against R or Python. In fact, sure. I really want to learn those. Um, I've barely dabbled in Python, but, like, I have not, I, I don't really know those two languages, so it's like those. Right. That's something that I really am interested in. But my companies I was at use SaaS, so I became really good at SaaS. <laughs> and that's good advice. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I like. So anyway, yeah. The the point is, I like like what you had to say there. Um, but I know you have started or are close to completing. I'm not sure. Working on a book for mm -hmm. R. Can you give us an idea of kind of the motivation for starting that and and how you even go about writing a book? on R for actuaries. Okay. So where that came from, uh, kind of two threads there. Uh, I've done a lot of R instruction for the CAS, taught workshops, or like one day workshops, day and a half workshops. And for the past three years, we do like a three and a half day, a three and two thirds day mm -hmm. intensive training for actuaries. Uh, what I found after about a year and a half or so of that was that a lot of uh, fairly basic material uh, not exciting, but necessary material was uh, content that we spent a lot of time on. And in a one-day workshop, trying to convey the message of here is something that you can do as an actuary. Uh, you have to learn a lot of very, very core data manipulation elements. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, you know what, I've got uh, four or five slide decks, you know, constituting X number of hours of material. Let's just put this into a text format. And when people are going to show up for the, uh, for the workshop, we'll say, look, read this before you get there and some light review, but otherwise we're going to hit the ground running with the fun stuff, the actuarial yes. stuff. Uh, so that became a text. I mean, it's out there. It's on, it's on, uh, online, uh, about like 70 pages or so. Uh, Shortly after that, sort of unrelated, I was contacted by Actex about doing some educational content and uh, in speaking to them, they said, well, you know, what ideas do you have about webinars, right. about this, or about that? Uh, and we talked to you and I did do some webinars for them. Uh, and I happened to mention, you know, I've got like 70 odd pages for, for a book. Uh, would that be something that you guys are interested in? They said, sure. Uh, and I had thought, and this is important for everybody to hear, I thought, uh, expanding that uh, shouldn't take more than a few weeks. How hard could that be? <laughs> How hard can that be? Famous last that words. Was, <laughs> yeah, that was like a year and a half ago. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not, now I'm happy to say that the final draft of the book is being copy edited and reviewed for yeah. technical content. So um, it may be published by Actex later this year. Uh, but how to write a book? I, I've almost figured that out. <laughs> I, yeah, that's, I mean, that's why I was so, cause like, this is probably, is this your first book that you've ever written then? Oh yeah. Oh okay. yeah. 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 I mean, I think it's, it's a very cool idea because it's not just a book about R, but it sounds like it's R for actuaries. So like why an yeah. actual, is it, am I correct about that? Correct. So all of the, uh, the data examples are meant to resonate with an actuarial audience. Uh, there's also a specific R package uh -huh. that has some functionality associated uh, uh, with actuarial practice. Uh, we have a chapter on credibility, uh, which probably not going to find elsewhere. Yeah, probably not. That's very actuarial <laughs> in nature. <laughs> wow. Okay. So this book, then, if it's kind of in the final stages, I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to jinx it by you saying it's going to be ready in a week or two. Do you? Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea of when it, this might be available? I, um, I, I can't remember what the other timeline is uh, from beginning of copy editing to appearance 
uh, in print form. Uh, I, I think the over under on its appearance would be December. Nice. Okay. So, so like Knockwood, it'll come out in 2019. Sure. If it doesn't, then it should be around pretty early 2020. Well, that's uh, exciting. I mean, I'm asking a little bit selfishly because it's something that I, I would be very interested in, in picking up and reading. Um, now yeah. that I'm going to be studying some graduate work in statistics, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sure I'll be doing a little bit of R, so I'll be interested in it. Uh, the other place where we hope that it will be helpful, and we had this in mind as we were uh, talking through the content of what would appear in the book, um, on the SOA syllabus, um, I'm a CIS guy, uh, so, so I can't remember which exam it is, but uh, R is a requirement for SOA exams now. Oh, um, really? I, I, I want to say that, yeah. So on the syllabus, there is there is a text for introductory R. Oh. Um, and it, 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 it's a good book. Yeah. Uh, but as an adjunct for exam preparation, uh, we're hoping that, that students may find this of use. Yeah, that's fantastic. So to the... Uh, another question kind of related to the whole automation programming side of things um, the the term machine learning is thrown mm -hmm. out a lot and I see that term all over the place right and I want to hear your opinion on how machine learning could affect the actuarial space actually maybe just start out with like what is machine learning and how could that affect actuaries cool I, 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 I I'm delighted that you brought that up um, <laughs> I find it hard to have like a sort of a crisp, useful definition for machine learning. Mm -hmm. I think that it is used, uh, it, it, different people may mean different things when they use the term. Uh, so the way that I kind of preserve my sanity is uh, I'm going to refer to like a specific class of models, uh, which would be like deep learning models. Okay. And so these are neural networks, uh, you know, we'll, we'll call them slightly more complex neural networks. And in the field of AI, that's generally what people are talking about. Things like image recognition, uh, uh, speech recognition, speech translation. Okay. So like so learning learning a, like what a face looks like or learning what a voice sounds like kind of a thing. The algorithm that will identify uh, your friends on a photo on Facebook or the algorithm that yes. will take a voicemail and render it to text Right. So like that's AI, that's deep learning. Okay. Um, I just started getting into that earlier this year. I mean, I, I'm, I'm aware of it, but I first started um, thinking about, well, how does one implement that? How does one construct a model? How does one do something useful about that? Uh, and I actually gave a presentation at the uh, CIS spring meeting earlier this year um, with, with, with a co-presenter, Steve Mildenhall, uh, who, who did, I think, two-thirds of the work and uh, his stuff was awesome. Mine was mine was okay. Uh, but I'm sure yours was great. So, like, here's a practical example. What I was really astonished by is the fact that the mechanics, which is to say, the, like the number of lines of code that I have to write to train a model and use it to make predictions, the number of lines of code that I have to write is worryingly small. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Because the you know the support packages, the support libraries are in 2019 very mature. Uh, there are a lot of open source implementations like TensorFlow uh, is one, and, and, and there are others, but but that's the one that I use. And so there there are interfaces and Python interfaces to these packages. So being able to establish a model is not hard. Um, once actuaries get to know that and get to embrace it, uh, I think things are going to start getting interesting. Mm -hmm. the, the problem domain for uh, machine learning at the moment is one where the, um, the signal to noise ratio is very, very high, uh, which is to say that things like image recognition, uh, there's not a lot of noise yeah. in recognizing a human face. Uh, now, having said that, uh, I, I think that there is space for um, a machine learning model, an AI model, being competitive with more traditional models in other contexts where the signal-to-noise ratio, is, it, it, like it's not the slam dunk in the way that image recognition is, in the mm -hmm. way that uh, uh, voice-to-text is. 
Uh, and I think that actuaries are going to be uh, pleased with having that as an additional color on their palette mm -hmm. of models. So like in what way do you feel like machine learning and artificial intelligence when an actuary, let's say that they're, um, let's say that they have a whole bunch of data and they're trying to, maybe they're trying to create a, a financial forecast based on historical data. Mm -hmm. They're looking out into the future. Yeah. Like you're, you're saying that machine learning or artificial intelligence could potentially go dig through all that data and find patterns for the actuary. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm hesitating. Um, in terms of finding patterns, um, I'll, I'll think a little bit about that language. Okay. <laughs> uh, actuaries, have been, actuaries have been developing predictive models to do that for a long time. Yes. One of the core differences here is rather than using a parametric view, mm -hmm. right? You know, you know, we have these probability density uh, uh tools that we apply to say uh, like a forecast let's say we're forecasting a time series yes um okay this is effectively a linear modeling problem uh and so linear modeling problem has a set of um, uh, support distributions be it gaussian be it uh, be it whatever mm -hmm. uh and so for us the key are the parameters mm -hmm. uh you know of the distribution and so we can you know we have these uh you know algebraic or, or calculus uh you know calculable uh, confidence intervals. The parameters of a machine learning model are not something, are not things that can be interpreted in that same way. And all right, so, short answer to your question, yes. Okay. No. Uh, long answer to your question, yes. And we will need to come up with new ways yeah. of storing the data. Interesting for the model yeah. and also new ways of interpreting the output because we don't have that kind of safety net of sure. the param. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be interesting. That kind of leads me to the, the next question is kind of looking out into the future. Actually, let's just look, let's just look one year into the future. I know that this may not all be implemented by then, but what would you say is the number one skill that an actuary should possess going into 2020? Um, and then to follow up with that, what would be like the number one skill going out 10, 20, 30 years from now? I think the skills in, in a very high level are not going to change. The skills I think have always been uh, a facility, there's sort of two, two really big, big skills, a facility with data, uh, more specifically a facility with the structure of mm. data you know, being able to ingest it and um, uh, modify it in whatever way one needs to to construct a statistical model. Uh, so, so, so facility with data, that's not going away. The structures and uh, storage formats will change. Yes. Uh, they're continuing to change. Uh, the second key skill is communication. Uh, that is going to be a, a very, very significant challenge. It has always been because uh, you and I are fine with talking about the differences between parametric and non-parametric models. <laughs> uh, other, other members of uh, the insurance industry, they're not innumerate, but yeah. this is something where uh, you, you need that spoonful of sugar to, yes. to get them to understand it. That is only going to get harder. Yeah. So I, I actually, maybe maybe that's my answer is uh, between the two, I think that um, uh, an ability to uh, communicate with the other stakeholders about why this decision was made beyond uh, the model tells me so is going to be very valuable. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of a recurring theme that I keep hearing is communication. A lot of people that I've talked to have said this, and I, mm -hmm. I mean... I would say the same thing. I mean, it's uh, you can you can do technical stuff, you can do math until you're blue in the face. But yeah. if if it's not communicated to someone and and digestible for the company to use, yeah. it's not really going to matter. <laughs> right. Right. So yeah, there they they there needs to be some credibility, uh, you know, some faith in in the mathematics. Yes. Um, and that's one where actuaries can 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 nudge a little bit further. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the mathematics that we have, the models that we have, uh, they work a lot, uh, or they, they, they work well. Yes. Uh, or very very often, and 
uh, I think that having, it, it'll be weird to say this, uh, I, 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 I sometimes get the sense that actuaries don't have enough faith in their models. I know that the popular perception is the opposite, uh-huh. um, but uh, you know, you create a model that works well, yeah. and you just don't mess with it. Okay. Well, I think that's similar to software engineers. A lot of them don't have faith in their code. <laughs> it's, right. It's right. it's scary yeah. once you you know you put this whole thing together, and then it's like mm-hmm. it's running and it's working, and then it's like yeah. you're always thinking because that's the way you're kind of supposed to think when you're programming. It's like there's there where are the errors? Where are the bugs? It, it, exactly. It, uh, models and, and computer coding are very similar in that respect mm-hmm. because there are two things uh, which are meant to scale. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, you know, programming, if it, if it ran slowly, no one would use it. Yep. Right? So the whole value proposition of computer programming is that I can do, you know, I, 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 can, I can scale up very, very quickly. It will right. take me you know, one nanosecond to operate on a million records. It will take me one minute to operate on like a billion records. Well, that means your speed to speed to error <laughs> is the same as speed to success. Yes. So, so, so you're operating with a lot at stake. Models are the same way. Yes. If they're going to go wrong, uh, they're going to go wrong at scale. Right. Well said. So uh, I don't know if this, hopefully this Zoom thing stays on. Apparently, from what I read, just so the audience knows, it said that we only had 40 minutes for the meeting, and I, I don't know if it'll boot us off or not, but we're still on, so that's good. Um, but I wanted to get to some final fun questions at the end here. Sure. Uh, do you read or listen to podcasts? And if so, what would you say is your favorite podcast and or book? Okay. Um so I'll answer the podcast one first because that'll that'll kind of destroy whatever uh, whatever actuarial credibility might have had. <laughs> Perfect. Um, yeah, the podcast. So I, I listen. I like. I, I love podcasts. Um, the only one that I listen to that would be sort of statistical or actuarial, uh, not so standard deviations, is good. Never even uh, heard of it. Oh, oh, it's good. It's good. So oh. uh, that's uh, Hillary Parker. I think she's at Stitch Fix, and uh, Roger Pang. Okay. Who I think is at Johns Hopkins. Uh, they're both data scientists, and it's basically just a conversation between between two people. That's good. So, Absolutely so that's my up. that's my professional recommendation. All right, let's all go non-professional. Other, <laughs> yeah, all of my other recommendations. So my favorite podcast is uh, is a thing called Harmontown. Um, and let's be very clear: it is, as the kids say, not safe for work. Uh, <laughs> that's all right. Uh, uh, this is the exact. This is the fun stuff we want to find out. <laughs> and it may be offensive. Um, it, 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 so uh, Dan Harmon is the creator of the t- television shows Community and Rick and Morty, and uh, once yes. a week he gets up on stage with a few other people and he just kind of talks. There's no format. There's nothing. Uh, it has been a fascinating window into uh, sort of Hollywood culture from like like a B list uh, sort of sort of a viewpoint. Interesting. Yeah. Also a fascinating insight into the creative process. Uh, it, it's been very very inspiring from that standpoint. Oh, I bet. Also, it's just really really funny. That's awesome. I'll have to check that one out. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a there's a lot of podcasts out there that I like too that are very yeah. uh, non professional, but I oh, yeah. it's fun finding out what people like. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's just a great way to check out. Yeah. Uh, in terms of books, uh, you know, it's funny. One of the great things about about the consulting that I've done, and I still do a bit of that on the side. Uh, it 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 feeds my textbook habit. Yeah. Yep. So I I get a lot of those, uh, and like I am the guy who will you know be at the airport or on the airplane, reading a math book. Nice. Uh, so both of those. Yeah. You're my kind of guy. That's awesome. That's uh I I've been known to do that at times as well. Yep. <laughs> um, final question is what is your favorite hobby outside of actuarial? I know you're a busy guy. You got a lot going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but besides everything we talked about, what are some of your favorite favorite things to do? Uh, I love to cook. Um, once a week at my house is pizza movie night. I make pizza. Nice. Uh, I like to bake. You know, I make bread. Uh, do other stuff. So, so I like to cook. That's a lot of fun. Um, also, uh, both cooking and my next answer are pretty cliche, but they're very, very true. I like to hang out with my wife. I like to hang out with my children. That's uh, they're that's awesome. a that's a great yeah. hobby right there. That's, that's perfect. That's what I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. How many kids do you have? Uh, two kids. Okay, very cool. Great intent. Hi. <laughs> hi. Hi over the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, uh, that is all I have for you. Thank you so much for coming on, Brian. Um, and I'm sure we'll stay in touch in the future. And anyone who was, was watching, if you have any programming questions or any thoughts on this, comment below. Uh, we'd love to see. We'd love to see that. I mean, I, I love programming as well, and that's why I was super excited to talk to Brian about all this. So, um, anyway, uh, thanks again for joining, and uh, we'll see you all next time. All right. Thanks you. Thank you. Thanks.